Please join me in welcoming Ben. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. Even more excited to see a standing room only. Uh, I've been hanging out in here for about an hour, and it didn't look like anyone was coming, so thank you. Um, so what is the sales guy doing at an IT data conference, right? It's like fish out of water, etc. But as Eric said, I have always been a tech guy stuck in a salesman's body. I love data. I love analytics. I like to know why things work. And from the time I was a teenager, I always studied sales and sales process, and I've read all the classics. And I continue to read every new book that comes out on sales. But I think that what I'm going to say today uh, should be extremely valuable because we're at this crossroads in our industry. You know, the wine industry is very traditional. And it's one of the last consumer product groups that does not use this rigorous discipline in their sales process. And even though we have data, and many of you spend a fortune on data, when you get it into the hands of the salespeople, they're not exactly sure what to do with it. And uh, so I'm going to kind of go through that. And uh, while I, there's lots of things I could talk about, I'm going to have my talk in two parts. The first part is three things that I think are, for lack of a better word, uh, broken in the wine business. And, and the solution to that brokenness, the thing that can fix that brokenness, is better use of data, technology, and the best practices to go with them. So I hope you find it interesting. A couple of qualifiers. Uh, normally, I don't always use the King's English, but I'm being filmed, so I will stick to, to that. No salty New England language for me today. So if, you're, if you heard me speak before, I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> the other thing is I'm probably going to offend some of you with these shocking uh, revelations about what's wrong with our industry. So I apologize in advance. Uh, the truth hurts. You can just live with it. And the other, th the other qualification is, you're, I think during some point of my talk, you're going to realize that the people who really need this talk aren't in the room. Okay? And so I want to equip you. And that's one of the reasons why I'm filming this. Because I really see this as a, an important message that needs to be delivered. It's great that it's coming from a sales guy. Nothing against the brilliance of this room. But there are, just aren't a lot of sales guys who get this stuff. So if I do my job right today, you will want a copy of this video, and I'll be happy to give you one. You can just send the email address. Um, I've always, as I said, I've always been interested in, in data. When I worked for St. Michelle Wine Estates and my, my brother, uh, Eric Johnson, and we were colleagues then, he can attest to this. But I would go, I lived, I lived in Dallas, I lived there my whole career. I, um, I would go up to the chateau, just this horrible slog of a trip all the way up to the Pacific Northwest, thinking, thank God I don't live here, because I'd cover the whole country and it would just be miserable. But as soon as I hit the ground, I got my rental car at SeaTac, I would go to the chateau, and where would I go, Eric? You could always find my rental car in the back of the chateau by the IT trailers, because I wanted to spend all my time with them. I was fascinated with all this new technology coming out, all this new data, because I remember we had no RAD data at all. And I was a national account, so I had no idea what these things we were doing were producing. And somewhere around that time, I guess, between, and I could be wrong on the timing, but somewhere around 2007-ish, the wine consortium was uh, in effect. Where's Abbott? I saw him come in. Here. Hey, Abbott, right? The wine consortium. And Constellation, so I was at St. Michelle. St. Michelle joined. Uh, Constellation had their data in there. I don't know if Gallo ever did, but Treasury did. And for the first time in the history of the wine business, you could run, you could look at data showing which restaurants in America were pouring the most $10 Chardonnays by the glass? There's the account name, address, and everything. And so I was very, very hungry for this kind of data. Um, uh, that was when I first learned that, and you, most of you remember this, and you probably won't find another salesperson who knows this, but there was a time when Excel was limited by the number of data rows you could put into an Excel spreadsheet. And that was not enough for me, so I, with my own money, I bought a subscription to Access, Microsoft Access, taught myself to write databases, and I started asking for data cubes and all of this so I could go, take it home and just really study it. And the things I learned during that brief window that the wine consortium was available, I've never to be seen again. And so if you weren't there, you missed it. It's like the solar eclipse. It'll be back, but it's 80 years away, and we'll all be dead. But uh, I've, so I've always loved data, and I've always loved the connection between business intelligence and sales results. And that's really the meat of my talk today. It's been said a couple different ways. You know, the intersection between sales and technology, or you know, how, t how technology can fuel sales growth. The potential's there, the latent potential's there, but my, the main thrust of my talk is about sales productivity 
enabled by technology, data, and the best practices. So we are, as an industry, we are a long ways off from other consumer product groups. And I'm going to generalize a lot today, so I apologize for that, because some of you are doing a brilliant job. Some of you are leading the, the way. So I don't mean to offend those of you who are early adopters and are doing a great job. But for the rest of us, OK, they need this stuff really badly. Uh, so I just got the fresh Nielsen's, uh, so as of uh, 52 weeks, as of mid. July, and I did a couple calculations before I came here. Literally half the brands that are reported in Nielsen's are Dow. So I don't know if any of you in this room would qualify in that group, but these are tough times for the wine business. This is the most competitive consumer product category on the planet, and as if, as if that's not complicated enough, it changes every year, and there's new players coming all the time. So many changes have taken place in this industry in the last five years, yet when you talk to the average sales leader, you'd think nothing has changed. They're still using the same playbook that they did 20 years ago. You know, the idea, the old saying that what got you here won't keep you here is absolutely true. I haven't even got to my first slide yet, so you can see how I could have used more time. But it's absolutely true. You know, and, and I, if there's distributors in the room, please don't take this the wrong way. I'm your biggest advocate. If you've read any of my blog posts, like stop depending so much on your distributors and, and why you can't expect your distributor to do all your work for you. Some of the biggest fans of those blog posts have been distributors writing to me saying, you're saying the things that we just, you know, we're not comfortable saying. But here's the old playbook. Uh, spend time with the distributor. Build relationships with the distributor. Incentivize the distributor. Work with the distributor. Take them on trips. Educate the distributor. And if none of that works, what do you do? You threaten the distributor. Although this, that's not nearly as popular as it was 20 years ago. But so, this, so something's got to change. So here's my, I'm going to get started in my talk now. I've just burned eight minutes on the intro. But uh, three things, three things that are broken in this industry, and here's where the offensive stuff starts. So what is that a picture of? Brokenness. <laughs> this is what's one of the things that's wrong with our industry. Now, I love this industry. I love wine. I got into it because I love wine. Our, our industry attracts people who are wine geeks, and I have nothing against them. But if that's a picture of a master sommelier or master of wine, I salute you. I could never do it. I have the palate of a wolf and an even worse memory. So these people deserve our undying respect and admiration. But master sommeliers are working somewhere in a restaurant, in a fine dining place, curating a fantastic list. Our industry needs these people. And masters of wines, you know, they're, they're just the gods of the industry. But if that's a picture of one of your salespeople, you should be a little bit worried. Because while it's good to know about wine and have all those certifications and numbers at the end of your, or, you know, whatever, at the end of your name, it's not enough. And that's one of the big problems. This could actually prohibit your company from reaching your sales goals. Too much emphasis on this could be inhibiting your sales goals. So, and here's an example. I bet I've been to 30 national sales meetings in my career. Always uh, used to like it more when I was younger. I hope to never go to another one again, unless I'm being paid to speak there. But uh, I would show up all excited to the national sales meeting, right? Thinking this is gonna be about sales. It was never about sales. And then I would see on the agenda, oh, we're gonna do some training this is the sales meeting, and we're going to do training. This will be fantastic. Oh, I hope we get into Daniel Pink's new book, you know, To Sell Us Human. And I hope we really get into some good segmentation and, and uh, you know, talk about the 80-20 rule and how it's real and how we can leverage it. But that's not what I see when I walk in the room. This is what I see. And smell, right? It's a fantastic smell. That's not sales training. It's product knowledge training, and that's fine. It's got a place. But I, I can't tell you a single time when I've ever sat through real sales training at a national sales meeting. So this is definitely one of the things that's broken. When I talk about sales training, I'm thinking of, of these things. These are the books in my library. The one that changed my life, it's right here. The, uh, check out the title, The Complete Guide to Accelerating Salesforce Performance. How many of you have that book on your bookshelf? Two people that I know probably got it for me. But anyway, <laughs> this is... This, oh, who doesn't want to, I mean, I encourage you to get online. It's, it's from the Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern. It's very dry reading. There's really only three chapters in there that you need to read, but it'll change your life. Territory optimization, account segmentation, allocating resources according to the potential for clients. This is sales training. I know it's boring as heck. I almost said the S word, but I'm being filmed. It's, it's very, very boring, I know. But, but you know what's even more boring? is shutting down your business or laying people off or staring in the warehouse at a bunch of wine that isn't sold while you're harvesting the next vintage. This is a business. And it's OK to be uh, uh, knowledgeable about the product. But it's not enough, especially in today's competitive environment. 
another, you know, another really great book, and so much of this stuff is about leveraging the 80-20 rule, which I'm going to talk about. But if you've never read The 4-Hour Workweek, right, it seems a little preposterous. It's, it's meant to be preposterous. But the, but the upshot of the book, and I'll save you 14 bucks, is that most things don't matter. We're caught up in trivia, and most things don't matter. And our industry is full of it. I've never seen a consumer product industry where we let our salespeople get away with so much just indiscriminate uh, activity. And that's, that's kind of a segue to my next uh, topic. So the first thing that's broken is, is too much emphasis on my knowledge and, it, and not balancing with some good solid business acumen and using data and technology and the disciplines and the best practices to go with it. It's a problem um, and it's fairly universal. The second, the second one is trivia. Salespeople left to their own devices do not always act in the best interest of the company, let alone their own best interest. I'm sorry, it's just a function of the personality of a sales type. Salespeople, like children, need direction. Now, I know that's offensive to some of you, but it's true. We hire salespeople for their wine knowledge and for their relationship skills, not because they're disciplined in the use of their time. And, and you know, here's where I'm going to offend some distributors. I, I would never work for a distributor again. I've worked for two different ones. Today is not a good time to work for a distributor because you've got to babysit all these people who have no plan, no structure. They don't have, know anything about their pricing. They don't understand which products are most profitable. They don't know what the priorities are. They're just kind of drifting around wherever the wind blows them. Uh, Anybody know I have a picture of this on here? Some of you may if you've heard me talk before. I love this concept of heat loss. See, this burner puts out a specific number of BTUs, which I have no idea what it stands for, but it's a measurement of its power, of what it's putting out. When you put a pot of water on a, a gas burner, 70 to 80% of the energy being produced dissipates into the air. Only about 20 or 30% makes it to the pan to boil the water. But that's okay. It's enough to boil the water. But what about the other 70 or 80%? Anyone here like to use a wok with a gas grill? What do you do to concentrate the heat? You put one of those rings around it, which cuts the heat loss, puts more, same amount of energy being put out, but it concentrates it in, in, a, in a better way. We have so much heat loss in our sales process. I have a great blog post called Five Ways to Stop Heat Loss in Your Sales Process. It's on my website. I recommend you read it for more uh, in depth. But this lack of discipline, this lack of uh, letting the data tell you where you should be uh, pointing your resources and your time is, is, is part of the reason why well, a lot of wineries are not making their goals. So uh, those were the, the three things. Uh, no, there were only two, right? Let me back up. Yeah, so the third thing is just this lack of rigor and discipline around, around sales. Um, I like to ask salespeople when I'm interviewing them or, or just salespeople I meet, uh, what, uh, what are your top accounts? Like, what are your top 10, 12 accounts? Uh, maybe they'll know. And, but then I ask them, well, what percentage of your total business do those accounts make up, both in dollars and in volume? And, and this is where I start to lose them. I'm like, well, you have to make choices about how you spend your time. How do you segment your accounts? And, you know, uh, what we have, and I'm going to show you in a minute with the 80-20 rule, we have a lot of wasted time. Uh, salespeople are expensive. And if you have a team of salespeople, next to your inventory, it's the most expensive thing on your P&L. We can't afford to have them running around nilly and willy, uh, you know, uh, just doing things because it's intuitive to them. And uh, I, some of these sales meetings I've been to, there was no talk of sales strategy. They would say things like, just do it or, you know, kick some butt. Uh, that's not very strategic, you know, <laughs> and it's not even really all that uh, motivating. And so there's got to be more rigor and discipline in the use of data and technology and the processes that go with them. So far, so good? Okay. So this is my recipe for how to accelerate sales. I don't have time to go into the first one. Uh, happy to talk to you more about it later. I'll be here all day. But stop depending so much on your distributors. I don't mean don't use distributors. We're always going to need them. They play an important role. But if you're sitting back expecting them to do all the work, and I get a lot of consulting clients calling me complaining that I've got 20, I'm in 20 states and I have distributors in every state, and they don't sell anything for me. I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> what? So another time, and I've written about this extensively, you can read it, but I want to focus on these last three. Uh, how many of you, now this is a real honesty check, uh, maybe I've already spoiled it. Is there anyone in the room that thinks the 80-20 rule is nothing more than a clever theory that they teach at business school, but in the real life, it's just not practical? Or you can also raise your hand if you think it's, it's sometimes true, but not always true. Anybody? Yeah, I didn't think you would raise your hand because I would, make, I would embarrass you. But uh, this is absolutely true. 
And people who ignore the 80-20 rule do so at their peril. Now, I'm going to use some real data to show you that, indeed, 20% of the business is gener 80% of the business is generated by 20% of the accounts. Sometimes it's 90-10. Sometimes it's 85-15. Sometimes it's 70-30. But the principle is always true. It's true for every consumer product category, for every price tier. I don't care if you make wine in Algeria or Sonoma. It's the same. And why there isn't more rigor around this is beside me, because we have the data. IT people in the room, could you tell us what 20% uh, of the accounts in the US are running 80% of the business? Yes, you absolutely could. So where's the plan? Why isn't there more uh, accountability for this? This is fresh off the of Nielsen's, the top 1,000 wine brands in unit sales. I've removed the names to protect the innocent. Uh, it's all you need to know is these are total unit sales by brand for the top 1,000 brands. If you can't tell that the business is concentrated in a small group of accounts, they're missing the point. But that's not enough. Let's, let's go deeper. Let's look at the growth. So what I did was I went into Nielsen's. I took all the companies who were growing. I took that level of growth, and I put it on this graph. Does it look familiar? What's ironic is it's even more concentrated. The growth is even more concentrated uh, into a fewer number of accounts. Uh, unit sales by manufacturer. Is anyone here from Nielsen? Thank you for calling this category manufacturer. We need it to be called manufacturer. Remember the guy with his nose in the glass? He would be so offended by that term, manufacturer. But this is a business. We manufacture wine, and Nielsen is kind enough to report performance by manufacturer. 80% uh, of the business being done in the, top, in the Nielsen uh, universe is done by a large... You can tell who the one on the left is, right? And probably the, the second one down. <laughs> But it's true for everything. Uh, here's wines in a can. Does the chart look familiar? Yes. How about uh, sake? A hot category? Same thing. It was really concentrated in sake. How about Armenian and Bulgarian wines? <laughs> it's true for everything. So let's get into some account stuff, OK? Because this is where it really gets interesting. Uh, this is from one of my consulting clients, so I will not name. This is for the state of Massachusetts. It looks at all retail accounts where they're doing business. Now, why is this, why is this graph? What's going on down here? Anybody? It's there. There's data there all the way up to 1,387 accounts. But why can't you see the data? Because I've only bought one case. Now, again, I don't want to offend any distributor people. But when you use the term account sold, that is a horrible term because it assumes all accounts are equal. I don't care about the account that bought one time and never bought again, especially the, uh, whether, what kind of gas they serve uh, at their pumps. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> the, this is true. Let's, say, let's look at a couple, just a couple more. Here's the top 500 distributor sales reps in the U.S. Do you see the same pattern? The other day I was coaching a, a, a salesperson at one of my consulting clients, and they, she had it in her business plan that she wanted to get to know all the reps in the in her distributorship. I'm like, that's a huge mistake. Because five or six of them are doing all the business. You need to get to know those five or six. And then find the one or two that should be in that group but aren't. And if they get a cold, you show up at their house with a box of Kleenex. Because these people are, are delivering the number. Isn't the goal to deliver the number at the end of the year? You know, there's something unique about the wine business you may or may not have thought about. You don't find it in the spirits business. You don't find it in the beer business. You don't find it in any other consumer product category. If we want to adjust our production up or down, how easy is that to do? Very difficult. It'll take four or five years to make that adjustment. Meeting your volume goal is the number one business imperative, but you would never know it by following around the average salesperson who runs down here with the distributor because, you know, and let's be honest, do you know why these are down here? Why so, why so many people play down in this space? Because they're the furthest accounts from the office. And you can suck up a lot of drive time for your, for your sales rep. Anybody relate to that? OK, well, take my word for it. It's true. <laughs> so here's the punchline of this. This comes right out of my favorite book, The Complete Guide to Accelerating Salesforce Performance. I made the point that salespeople do not always act in the interest, best interest of the company. They tend, so the potential for accounts is always concentrated, always concentrated. The, in fact, it's segmented too, it's fractal. So the top 10% of the account base in terms of potential is, is almost a third bigger than the second uh, uh, 10%. What do you call that? There's a term for the tenth, one tenth. Anyway, you get the idea. So the top one third of the account base 
is a tremendous, almost half the business. But salespeople tend to spread their effort equally because they've not been taught or they're not directed that not all accounts are equal. Um, it, it reminds me of a, a, a sales meeting I attended for one of my clients and we were sitting around the conference table and they were uh, on the agenda was an item called their small state strategy. And I'm like, well, this will be interesting. And so they start talking about, you know, we need a strategy where we can get into all these small states and just, you know, they're just uh, ripe for the picking. And I listened to this after a while, and my eyes got big, and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You realize that 51% of all the wine business in the U.S. is done in nine states, and that the bottom 20 states do less than 8%. Any time spent talking about small states is a waste of time and a joke, and you could have heard a pin drop. But see, this is the application of business acumen and data and business intelligence. In the absence of it, people do all kind of stupid stuff, like have a small state strategy. What the hell is that? <laughs> so this is really, whoops. I'm going to really insult a few people in a minute. Uh, so this, this can be stopped. This can be stopped. The key to accelerating Salesforce performance is to identify the top 20 to 30% of the accounts that do all the volume and stop calling on the other accounts. It costs about $80 to $120 every time one of your salespeople gets out of the car. If they go and sell a case of wine, they should be shot on site for robbing from the company. <laughs> but this happens. It happens in your company, and you've got to stop it. And if you guys don't stop it, it's not going to get stopped. Salespeople aren't going to wake up and go, you know, I really need to start segmenting my accounts. This is going to stop calling on all this low-value stuff, all this trivia. It's never going to happen. But data, technology, and the best practice to go with it could just turn things around for you and your company. When we leave here, you should rush for the, well, they don't have pay phones here. But if there was a bank of pay phones, you should rush to the pay phone and talk to your sales manager and say, we got to talk because we don't need to have this mediocre performance. And if those of you who are thinking, hey, 10, 12, 16% growth is great, I got news for you. Why? It could be 30 or 40. It's not that big of a leap from 16% from to 30% when you start applying these principles. So there's two ways to look at my box of crayon analogy. Uh, in, one is the trivia, right? Our salespeople are running around with 96 crayons in their car. Uh, just swatting at anything that moves. There's no discipline. It's randomness. It's intuitiveness. And then there's this, you know, there's a saying that only a few things matter, but they matter a lot. And if you don't know what those things are, by market, by segment, by tier of your portfolio, you're going to get your head bashed in because people are, are figuring this out at a very rapid rate. So this is my other favorite topic. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but whatever you measure, you'll get more of. So if you want more sales calls, measure the number of sales calls. Good for you. Does more sales calls equate to more sales? The part of our brain thinks it does, but it's just not true. It's, it's, it, you've got to be more disciplined. Uh, old, I, old school, new school, call them whatever you want. My friends at Grapevines refer to these as lagging indicators and leading indicators, and there's a lot more. So shipments, depletions, accounts sold. I hate the term account sold because it, it assumes all accounts are equal. It's a hollow metric. It's a useless metric. Uh, I, my theory is distributors like it because it allows to create a level playing field. You know, hey, your account sold are up 10%. Stop complaining. I got 20 people behind you who are only up, you know. And again, nothing against distributors. But we've allowed this. We've allowed this to happen. Don't let other people set the rules of the game for you. How about measurements like sales per point of distribution? Uh, velocity. How about point of distribution within target accounts? We've identified these accounts that drive 80% of the business. We want to restrict our sales activity to those. How are we doing? You need to measure that. Number of engaged accounts. How many of you now measure the number of engaged accounts? How many of you have that defined in your organization? Here's how I define it. When a restaurant uses a Chardonnay by the glass and they run out, guess what they do? They order another case. And when they've gone through that one, guess what they do? They order another case month after month after month. How long are people using the product that you've placed? Because anything less than a month or a week or two, is what you would have been better off not going in there. So you need to measure the number of engaged accounts you have. You need to protect them. You need to put resources against them. Market penetration, we, we, couldn't, we didn't used to be able to measure this, right? You need to be able to have some access to white space. But that data is starting to show up, and many people are using it now. Right wines in the right places. A very overlooked discipline of our industry. If you make a high image account, high profit, and you want it in the high image restaurants, you need to have a plan. But how would you, even if you made a list and said to your sales team, uh, we want these wines in these types of restaurants, what typically happens to that list? It goes to the distributor. 
which is, you might as well just put it in the paper shredder because they've got too many other things to do. They can't manage your priorities down to that granularity. But with a tool like CRM, you can do all of these things. You can measure all of these things. So there's really no excuse for not measuring these things. So I'm going to wrap up with CRM, and I want to save a few minutes for, for questions. Um, so CRM, one of my favorite topics. Uh, when I ask cl consulting clients, uh, do, you use, do you use CRM? I only ever get one of two answers, OK? One is yes, right? That's good. The other is, what is CRM? <laughs> this is 2018, right? And it's all, August is almost over. I don't know how we got this far and in this shape without uh, using this very, very standard tool for consumer product. Now, I've heard every excuse in the world, uh, and I've, ri I've written them down in case I forgot any. One, it's too expensive. Well, so is failure. So is going out of business. I tell people, fire your least productive salesperson and put the money in CRM. This is a no-brainer. I don't, I don't get that. You know, cost and expense uh, can only be uh, talked about in the absence of value. What would you, if I said, hey, uh, you have a chance to spend $30,000 and get a million dollars in return, what would you say? Oh, 30,000, I don't know, 30,000, that's, so, that's so much money, I, I don't, this is crazy, get over it. Um, big brother, right? Oh, it's too big brother, right? Uh, here's where I have to really restrain myself with the King's English. Of course it's big brother, he owns a freaking company. You, in what world do you get to work somewhere and get a paycheck and a car allowance and a travel allowance and not be accountable for your results? Get over the big brother thing. And if any of your salespeople say that to them, ask them for a copy of their pay stub. Ask them whose signature's on it and tell them to go back to work. If they want to not fill out CRM and be accountable for results, they can do what I did. Quit your job. Live off your own resources for two years. Lay awake at night wondering if you did the right thing bust your butt to build something, then you don't have to use CRM. Ironically, I've used CRM every day of that. So the whole big brother thing is just a hollow argument. Don't put up with it for a second. Adoption, right? Adoption is a big problem. Well, part of the reason adoption is a problem is because people want to move fast. Everybody's so impatient, right? It takes time to get salespeople to adopt CRM. You have to start with baby steps. And don't be in a hurry. Be patient. Don't try to train everyone at once, either. Because like the 80-20 rule, 20% will get it right away and off to the races. The other 80%, uh, uh, the other inspection will never get it. They're your remedial people. But don't let a little bit of uh, st stopping and starting on, on, on uh, adoption stop you from, from entering into it. And I can talk more about that. Don't be coddling people. This is the only industry where we coddle our salespeople. You know, salespeople push back. Ah, oh, these are my accounts. These are my customers. I, I'm not going to share that information on, on, uh, on CRM. Uh, okay, you, a letter of resignation will do just fine. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so good things about CRM. It gives you a clear line of sight to everything that's going on to everyone in the company. Any marketing people in here? Wouldn't it be great to see what consumers are saying or trade people are saying when, you're, um, when people are presenting stuff? Uh, they're talking about CRM over there, DTC. All the investment has gone to DTC. Good for them. There's applications here for the trade that aren't being used, that aren't being fully leveraged. And having a clear line of sight into what people are doing, being able to react quickly, having it across the organization, one version of the truth, available 24-7 on your cell phone. And, you know, I'm conversant in several different CRM tools. Uh, I'm a salesforce.com guy, so naturally I, I gravitate to grapevines. But I've recently begun um, getting to know other ones. But here I go on my phone. I open my salesforce.com. But it knows where I am. It knows where I am. It knows who the buyer is here. It knows how many of my products this hotel has purchased. When's the last time they ordered? On my phone. So I don't know what it is you're doing with Excel spreadsheets and, and email. You know, if people keep stuff in their email inbox. It's just insane. Anyway, I think I've made my point. Activity is not equal results. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm fresh out of time. But I would like to take a couple of questions. Uh, enjoying Salesforce? Tap to rate. I'm going to give you a five. That's awesome. Okay, so questions. Does this resonate? Does anybody have a different opinion now than before you walked in? A different perspective? Question. Okay. Bye. So if we're one of these champions who get it and see the light, but we're having a hard time getting our management to embrace the idea of utilizing CRM, would you recommend maybe trialing like the productivity apps that are out there? 
out there now where a few of us maybe are actually tracking like how much time we spend on you know out of stocks or compliance or calling up hog accounts or just for them to be able to see data that shows like look this is not a good use of our time this current strategy yeah so the question is you know uh, if you're not the president of the company or the top salesperson what can you do downstream in the hierarchy to affect this kind of change you know and I, I, I would say, uh, and I know lots of people who just go and get their own little version of CRM and so they can keep track of their own customers, their own activity, and their own results, and you could use that as a prototype. What you're talking about is very, very difficult. I mean, even the professionals in this room who are trying to uh, convince big companies to use CRM, even they struggle with it talking to the top people. It's a culture shift. But I think it starts, it starts with understanding what's missing. People are, uh, fear of loss is a greater motivator than the desire for gain. So, you need to be paying, uh, never stop beating the drum, never stop talking about it when, in every forum that you get, uh, never stop grinding on your immediate supervisor about why you need these things. You know, I, I asked for this all 12 years at St. Michelle, never got it. I got to Constellation and I didn't even get to ask because I wasn't allowed to talk to the person I needed to talk to. So when I started my own company, the first thing I did was get a subscription to Salesforce. So, I mean, everyone can affect change from where you are, but it starts with understanding this conversation, right, about, this, we're not gonna, you've gotta meet your business goals. You have to have, use data technology and best practices. Any failure to do that, uh, you know, your only excuse would be if your business is really good. If your business is really good, then I guess you don't have to. Not a very cogent answer to your question. It's tough, it's tough to affect change from the ranks. Very, very tough. Other questions? Tom. Whoops. Well, that's a good question. You know, um, one of the ways to improve adoption is to show what's in it for them, right? There, I like to tell people, you're already tracking this stuff. You're just doing a crappy job of it. You're doing it in Excel and in the notes section of your Outlook uh, emails. So you're already tracking stuff. And if you're not tracking your sales activity and stuff, well, then, you know, you're, you're not going to be very successful. The other thing is showing them how it can save them time. You know, the average sales rep spends six to eight hours preparing for a distributor business review, right? Because nothing worse than going into the distributor with where well, they've got better numbers than you do. And you know, it's easier and easier and easier now to walk in with better numbers because they're not gonna take the time that you did to study the state of your business. But get it, being able to speak intelligently about the quality of your distribution is only a couple of mouse clicks away. You build the reports once, you run the reports. What I do for my consulting clients is give them a template of reports that you should take to every business review, starting with your current inventory, days on hand, rate of sale, and recommended orders. All this can be set up in, in CRM. Uh, the quality of distribution, these are our target accounts. These are the accounts where we want our high-end wines. These high-end restaurants, how are we doing with this? So showing them how to use CRM to make them better business people. It's tough. It's tough, though, because people default. They default to their own stuff. You know, there are big companies right now that ha are paying for this stuff, but they still go back to the distributor's reporting tool because they're just, it's, it's their comfort level to default. So it's a constant struggle. Uh, the good news is, uh, Guys that look like you and me, Tom, will be dead in 15 years, so the, the, the new people can carry on. But let's not go down as the generation that, that failed to act on one of the greatest things that could possibly affect the wine business. So I'm, sir, am, I, am I over two minutes, Will? Okay, that's probably enough. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it.